Hi, everyone. I am uh, beyond thrilled to, uh, to have Andrea uh, join us today. Um, uh, she's going to talk about a um, mix of physical architecture and virtual architecture, which, um, and in particular, very complex architecture that sounds um, uh, extremely exciting. I don't think we've had anyone uh, ever in this series that uh, is bridging uh, such areas that seem very related, but uh, on the other hand, seems also very uh, challenging and interesting. Andrea is the CEO and co-founder of Numena, an award-winning interdisciplinary company that designs and develops uh, both physical and virtual spaces. Andrea is a uh, trained architect from MIT and Yale, was awarded the gold medal for best graduating master student by the American Institute of Architects. I guess also uh, worked as a, um, yeah, in a prime architect um, uh, firms prior to establishing a startup. Uh, so super excited to have you here, Andrea. Please take it away. As I mentioned before, I'm already inspired by your title and abstract. Uh, so it's very exciting. The title of the talk is, where are you? Who are you? The thinning thickness of the real. Thank you so much. Um, it's wonderful to be here tonight. I think the lecture is going to be a little bit unconventional compared to maybe what you've had in the past. Um, if you are utterly confused by the end, um, that's partly by design. And I just hope we're going to have a wonderful, exciting debate um, after the talk. Um, so just one sentence about myself. Um, I'm in love with three things, philosophy, architecture, and tech and programming. The first two things, I, I fell in love with them when I was very, very young. Um, I, I learned how to code in MS-DOS with my father in the mid 80s. Um, I did not pursue coding professionally. I ended up um, going to architecture school, but um, I've always said in the back of my mind this idea, how can I combine the two things in a way that's kind of intellectual and creative? And 15 years ago, when I was thinking about career paths, um, there was no way to combine them. There still isn't, although it's starting to enter the conversation. Um, and when I found virtual reality, I thought, oh my God, this is it. Um, I put on a DK1 or two, I think it was several years ago. And um, the moment I put it on, I realized that to be able to create VR applications, you need two things. You need to understand space, and to have the skills to produce the 3D objects you need to put into that virtual space. And you need to be able to code the behaviors um, that are applied on top of that. Um, and the second that went through my head, I thought, oh my God, this is it. This is what I've been waiting for. Um, and then I quit my job and started this company that basically is dedicated to combining architecture and VR. Um, through the complicated path of philosophy. So that's what I'm going to try to a bit introduce you to. Um, what you will hear in this lecture is, um, is what goes on in the back of my mind every day. Um, some ideas are a little bit complicated and exotic, um, but they are actually slowly but certainly um, making their way into our work. So, um, I'm a huge fan of Daniel Dennett. I'm sure most of you are probably familiar with him. He's a philosopher and a neuroscientist, very famous for his stance on consciousness. And I was listening to a podcast with him on the Mindscape podcast, and he started to say some interesting things, as always, um, things I hadn't read in his books before. Um, he said that information, so this, this age of information we live in, is the second age of transparency. And that sound, sound, sounded very interesting to me. And he went on to say, of course, that the fact that we now have access to all this data about our behavior and all other aspects of our life, and we can analyze this data, is going to lead to massive changes in, in how we live life and how we interact with the world. Um, but of course, then the, the postcat host asked him, okay, sounds great, I agree with that, but what is the first age of transparency if this is the second? And he answered by referring to the work of Andrew Parker. Basically, Parker is talking about how the removal of gases after the Cambrian explosion created clean air. And this led to changes in the perception instruments of bodies. So basically, the first stage of transparency is a literal transparency of the air that ended up 
changing the by the functioning of biological bodies and perception. Um, and I thought that was kind of interesting. And I said, huh, OK, so the, the meaning of transparency in these two, the first and the second age is obviously quite different, right? The data we're collecting has nothing to do with our biological bodies, um, or does it? So what came to my mind as I was pondering these questions um, is the very beginning of the age of information. And by that, I mean, of course, the 1940s, the Macy conferences and the start of cybernetics. And I remember reading some transcripts actually from these conferences and being completely fascinated by their fascination at the time with a study on the perception of frogs. And actually, all of these discussions of the input output feedback started from trying to understand perception in this in these biological organisms. Um, so and, and then, um, of course, we've all heard of this book from Norbert Wiener, and it's called Cybernetics or Control and Communication in the Animal and the Machine. So somehow at the, at the, at the core of this age of information that we are kind of following along with is this parallel between the machine and the animal. So let's go back to this first age of transparency and the second one. So data is being collected that describes behaviors. Uh, this data is used to infer all sorts of things and help us in all sorts of ways. Um, but there is one technological context in which maybe we might be able to talk again about input and output in biological organisms. Uh, and that context is, of course, VR. So maybe with VR, we have the ability to fine tune our input at unprecedented scale. And we know that the brain constructs things and is particularly fond of vision, which is exactly what virtual reality takes advantage of. Um, so let's take a closer look at this. Exactly what do I mean by the brain constructs things? Again, most of you have heard of the rubber hand illusion. So we're quite familiar by now and totally fascinated by this idea of neural plasticity. And again, using vision to trick the brain very, very fast. It's actually scary how fast it is if you've ever tried it. Uh, but it's not just vision. There's, of course, the work of David Eagleman um, and his experiments with sensory substitution. So here, he is using a haptic vest to help uh, people hear things. Um, and something quite interesting came out a few years ago from Stanford in 2016. A paper that starts with the title, Homuncular Flexibility. Wait, what is this? Um, so let's re read inside the abstract. Homuncular flexibility posits that the homunculus, so this part of the brain, is capable of adapting to novel bodies, in particular bodies that have extra appendages. Wait, what? This is like the fourth sentence in the abstract. They're actually talking about different kinds of bodies. And then it, it, uh, it keeps going. The recent advent of virtual reality technology which can track physical human motions and display them on avatars allows for the wholly new human experience of inhabiting distinctly non-human bodies. So forget about mistaking your real hand for a rubber hand and hearing with your vest. We can actually go all the way to inhabiting non-human bodies, which is kind of total insanity. Um, but here we are with this technology on our hands. So what exactly will this do to us? Um, who or what will we become? Well, let's then maybe take a step back before we jump into attempting to answer this kind of perilous questions. Um, and I would like to propose that maybe it's not about who or what we will become maybe just maybe it's about who or what we've always been so let's take a step back totally totally zoom out and um here's a diagram that you see in 
a lot of conversations that have to do with um, philosophy and technology. So you have these three entities, basically us, and of course we are surrounded, coated in technology, um, and we've been we've been inventing technology for many many millennia actually that help us see better, run faster, and so on. And then these two things are always described as being against the world. So the world is in the background of these two things. And then various theories posit many different kinds of relationships between these three entities. But I would like to talk a little bit more about the perfection of this circle that is around us implying that we are some kind of unitary thing with well-defined borders um, that creates these clear boundaries between us and technology and then between technology and the world. And I propose again that we are not against the background of the world, um, but we actually construct the world and the world constructs us. So here's the most basic way to think about this. I touch a glass and I feel the surface of the glass, but I also feel my hand and the surface of my hand. So basically it's not just that I confirm the existence um, and the physical properties of this glass, but that the glass confirms me. It places my hand into physical space. Now, is this it? Are you convinced? Well, maybe you are, but of course, this is not sufficient to go into the depths of such kind of major statements about the world and who we are, um, or even to see how they could be useful as a methodology for any kind of um, endeavor. So going ahead, um, I say, let's go deeper. Let's go down the rabbit hole. and. Here is where I want to open a parenthesis and say, I think it's supremely important for anyone who ventures into talking about such philosophical abstract concepts to be transparent about what their sources are, like what's their methodology, what's the background against which they're kind of expressing these ideas. Because um, there are many, many, many ways to interpret and explain what, what I just said, and many schools of thought, of thought that allow you to posit these kind of relationships between self-perception and world. And for this talk, we're going to go down that particular hole, which is phenomenology. Um, phenomenology is a, um, a school of thought within continental philosophy that um, was started by Husserl, and then was really taken to the next level in terms of turning it into something that could be very useful for other disciplines um, by Merleau Ponty, and specifically the book Phenomenology of Perception, that's absolutely a monumental piece of work, maybe top three um, most significant books in philosophy published in 1945. So what you're gonna hear from now on um, is gonna be based on this book and um, I'm going to also use some direct quotes from Mary Ponty, but of course try to frame the entire discussion in terms of um, what I think is actually happening with VR. So what's phenomenology? Um, or rather, how is phenomenology dealing with these big issues um, that makes it distinct from other schools of thought? At the center is this idea of bracketing, also referred to as phenomenological reduction, epoche, or my favorite, lifting of the veil. What does this mean? It means you start by accepting the fact that you don't really know reality. Um, or rather, before you venture into making any statements about physical reality, you should first clearly understand your perceptions and how it feels to see or hear things and exactly how we are processing internally uh, this information we're getting from the senses. And um, this, um, of course, was first proposed by Husserl via Kant, because all good ideas from philosophy actually come from Kant. Um, 
So we can't make any, any definitive statements about the world, but we do know for sure that experience is always real. Um, it's not that easy, however, right? There are many challenges to this, no matter how profoundly true this sentence is. And here are the challenges. First, each animal is a different way of knowing the world. Um, so when you change the perceptual apparatus, the world will appear to you differently. So major problem in trying to then understand the world. Um, and I like to put this in here. This, um, this is an older screenshot I took inside Unity. These are the eyes. This was a game object called the eyes that Steam VR came with. And um, it's kind of fascinating to go down each of these settings and see how our eyes in VR are actually fabricated. So you can just um, touch that slider and you will change the, the field of view and so on. And um, it's actually by design that your eyes in VR make you see things in VR the way the eyes see things in physical reality. Um, the second issue, the senses can be easily fooled. Uh, plasticity, so we talked before about the rubber, glo uh, rubber, glove, um, rubber hand illusion. And um, also it keeps going, it gets worse. What we perceive is determined by the method we use to perceive. So here's the classical example from what is called experimental uh, phenomenology. You've all seen this, the Necker cube. So the first two interpretations, the cube seen from the top and cube seen from the bottom are the main ones. But um, in experimental studies, they found people seeing all of these other things into this. So you can train your mind to kind of switch between all of these ways of seeing and, and you've all know it actually changes, like what you see actually flips from one version to the other. Um, so we have, we have um, how we perceive, um, which in phenomenology is called noesis. So it's, this is the meaning giving mechanism. And then we have what we perceive or noema, and this is the content. So the eyes feed us some information. There is some internal process that gives meaning to this information. And then we see the object. Um, and of course, the object that we see and we're able to name has some kind of undefinable relationship to something in reality, which we can't really, but we can't really know what the relationship is. We can't really know what that reality is. Um, so with practice, perceptions can change and they can change very, very fast, like the Necker cube. Um, we know that. But they do not change in daily life, right? So here are three more examples um, of such, um, such shapes that we can flip. So for example, the one on the left kind of looks like a roof, right? But when I walk on a sidewalk um, and I look at houses, that shape that's the roof never flips, right? Perception and the meaning of what we see is stable in 99.999% of, of everyday life. Um, and that's the reason why we call these things illusions, right? It just, they, they don't flip. The Necker cube doesn't flip if it's something. And that's the key. The reason why they don't flip is because they have meaning on top of them. So I never see this abstract shape in real life. I see a roof and the roof and the notion of the roof comes with a richness of, of meaning that prevents my brain from flipping it. My brain just knows exactly what it is. Um, yes, yeah, so I just answered this. What prevents us from getting lost in this extremely unstable nature of our per perceptions? Um, and here's the Merleau-Ponty answer. The first answer, and this mirrors the title of my talk, is the thickness of the world. So what he means by the thickness of the world is exactly this idea that everything we interact with 
um, has cultural and social meaning. It's not an abstract shape or an abstract object. In fact, it is the abstract, abstract, abstract shapes and abstract objects which we cannot categorize because maybe it's something completely new, maybe we've never seen it before. Those are the stuff that we can flip. Um, and the second thing that Merleau-Ponty talks about is that the life we're born into has organizing structures. So it's not just that the roof is this thing that goes on a house, but there are all of the social layers that kind of place the roof and the notion of the roof into a larger notion of family and home. And this is my street and behind it is the school I went to when I was five years old. So this is what he calls the organizing structures, which like an onion add more and more layers to stabilize the meaning of that perception. Um, a phrase that Merleau-Ponty uses a lot, which I love to describe all these things, is also the world is pregnant with sense. So this is uh, back to the earlier diagram where I, I used this notion of noesis, the, the meaning giving function. So these, these onion layers of, of, of so the social basically control or even make the meaning giving function. Um, and here's a, here's a quote that I like a lot. Um, this dialogue between subject and object, so me and the shape and the house, the roof, where the subject um, takes up the sense scattered across the object and the object gathers together the subject's intentions, arranges a world around the subject that speaks to him on the topic of himself and places his own thoughts into the world. So it's not just that I give meaning to this shape that's a house or a, the cube is not a cube, it's a house. Um, but also by seeing these things, they also kind of just like me touching the glass, how, how the, the coldness and the physicality of the glass confirm the position of my hand, thinking about these objects in these terms also define my place in the world in relationship to them. Um, so this is these are the things that are important for us to make sense of our perceptions um the fact that the world is pregnant with sense that there is a consistent predictive quality guaranteed by uniform sensorial input so it's not that today i see as a human being and then i wake up tomorrow and for 24 hours i'm going to see like a frog right that's not the case um, and consistent physical properties, right? So there is a, there's a predictive quality in the way our brain works. And, um, and we're so good at that because most things uh, behave the way we're used for them to behave. Um, and actually, if you look at these three things and go one by one you, and try to apply them to VR, you are going to realize that well, things are starting to get interesting. So here's another screenshot from Unity that allows you to control physics. So mess with these um, and do it in a way that's not consistent from experience to experience. And number three, consistent physical property goes out the door. Um, but you're gonna say, okay, so we were designed to stay cognitively flexible and to adapt. So the fact that it is so easy to trick our brain um, is what makes us so smart and, and so flexible. And that's kind of one of the best things about us. That's how we've survived for so long. So here we get to a bit of a crossroad. We can either adopt the position of saying, well, adapting to a computer generated world is maybe adapting to the wrong thing. Maybe we're just too smart for our own good. I mean, it's just insanity to, to start to decipher and, and, and tune our predictive abilities into some random VR application where some programmer just moved the settings to some wacko thing. 
Um, and Merleau-Ponty comes to warn us in this direction. He says, if the world falls to pieces is because one's own body has ceased to be a knowing body and has ceased to envelop all the objects in a single hold. Because of course, the world is the homeland of all rationality. So we're going to lose grip on, well, pretty much everything. Um, the moment our body loses the power to predict and to observe and to engage with the world of meaning. Uh, but there is a second possibility, right? And the second possibility is to say, well, let's just get real about what and who we are. Um, and perhaps VR can take us closer to the truth, where truth here is seen not as the ultimate statement, but as process. So we are adaptable creatures, and this is maybe at the core of who we are. And because of VR, we now have a methodological tool to dive deeper into that. Um, let's just indulge for a little bit longer with this second path and talk briefly about some potential applications of these strange new possibilities that we have opening up. Um, the first one, which is, um, I call it the more pedestrian one, just to start with, is something I actually deeply believe in. I believe there is value in using VR to place ourselves in a position to make decisions to different cognitive pathways. And since I'm an architect, I'm going to give you an example of what I mean by this um, within architecture. So. We're currently developing um, what's called a creative tool meant to allow you to design buildings straight in VR. And we're hoping that this has a shot at replacing other platforms that you might be using for conceptual design. So how does, how does the process work when you want to design a building? So it starts with a need, an idea, and then hopefully some kind of creative impulse that's 100% in your in the murkiness of your brain. And then it goes to 2D, or at least that's what we've been doing for thousands of years. Um, and this is what has taken architecture as a discipline to the next level when we invented the printing press. So you the fastest and most economical way to get this idea of a building out of your head and communicate it to other people is to just draw something on a 2d piece of paper reproduce that and then distribute it um and the ultimate goal of course of this exercise is to be able to communicate this idea in your head to the workers that are actually responsible for building the building. And it's a matter of also of control. So you want to draw every single corner of the building so that the workers don't have to really think about anything and just build exactly what you want them to build. Um, but of course, the, the two dimensions of the piece of paper are leaving out and even ignoring a huge chunk of what a building is. I mean, a building is a very complex three dimensional object that can't really be fully represented in the two axes. So in this wonderful age of information, of course, we started right away to produce these virtual environments on the screen. Um, so we have two screen based software that adds another spatial dimension to the 2D piece of paper. So now we can model things in X, Y, Z. Um, and I argue, of course, that VR um, adds on top of that extra dimension. So now we just keep, we basically, this, this technological evolution basically allows us in this context to keep adding dimensions to it. Um, and in VR, you are in some kind of abstract three-dimensional space. You can walk into your building and the dimension that's added, I don't want necessarily to say it's time, but basically the core concept of a building should not be something that can be understood through 
by looking at a picture or a two dimensional drawing. The concept of the building should be something that you experience by being in there and by walking through the building. So, of course, there's a time element to that, but that's how the heart of the building and the idea should reveal itself to you. Um, there are many reasons why this idea of what buildings are or should be has not been at the forefront of architectural practice and theory in the past few hundred years, because the leaning paradigm, of course, across the disciplines has been rationality. Um, and going back to phenomenology and saying, well, I want to, the, the core of the building is actually me walking through the building um, does not align very well with, um, with the philosophical concepts of rationality. Um, so why is this why is this important? Um, well, two big two two big reasons. You actually and, and speaking from experience, um, you when when you switch between these different modes, when you keep adding dimensions to your workflow, um, you you just end up designing different things. You make this in this you make design decisions in um in these different modes of operating that you would not have taken in the previous one um and in architecture specifically this very clearly leads you to designing built spaces and building styles that we haven't seen before so i think designing the simple fact of designing um in virtual reality is going to lead to a world and to cityscapes that just look differently um what happens to me when i design in vr i i, I go in and i just design at one-to-one -one scale for quite some time and when i then leave one-to-one -one scale and i get go, and i i activate a bird's eye view of what i just did um in many cases i'm super surprised um I'm like, wow, did I really do that? Did, did this really look like that? Um, and I get a feeling that there's a different kind of me, there's a different kind of designer and a different kind of person that I did not know before I had VR that kind of emerge because it did my, my brain is engaging with walls and windows and whatever element you have in your process um, in such fundamentally different ways. Um, but let's go now into more interesting territory, I would say, and talk a little bit about virtual architecture that's never meant to be built. Um, it's meant to, it's designed to always stay virtual in, as a, in, in the form of a virtual environment. Um, so if you want to be adventurous, try going into um, your game engine of choice and duplicate your hand. Uh, imagine what's shown in this picture is actually the hand of the, I don't know, the Oculus SDK and um, make a twin of that that copies the initial one and see what happens. Or just be creative uh, with the way you are pairing these two hands and spend some time in that scene, give it a shot. And I can almost guarantee that interesting things will start happening to you and your brain and your perception will get a bit twisted and your proper perception will go to interesting places um, and it doesn't take long at all. This is not this um, this happens not just if you duplicate your hand or part of your body this also happens if you do it with um with the environment with this virtual architecture so this is a screenshot from half-life alex um which i'm sure you've all played this is the last chapter where things are actually getting interesting and um i talk about this in another talk i gave it's fascinating to me to see how um this mirroring and duplication of the world of the architecture is not new within the discipline of architecture. We've actually seen this in several um, examples of churches in Italy from the 1660s. Um, and here's a diagram of what happens in this picture on the right. Basically, um, the architect designed this um, as if 
you have multiple view centers that are happening there simultaneously. And this is from an exhibition on Boromini from, that was at Harvard a few years ago. And the conversation is absolutely that the implication in Boromini's work, for example, that again, the, the architect who designed this thing on the right, um, is that there's a multiplicity of the subject. The subject, um, the subject meets this architecture as if they were in multiple points and multiple places at the same time. So it's a very interesting kind of subject than, for example, the subject of Roman or Greek architecture that's meant to look at the building and perceive it um, frontally. So we are not one in these spaces. We are maybe multiples of us. And I want to go back to the observation that um, these things I'm talking about are not some kind of edge cases where we go through a lot of uh, when we go through pain to just create this uh, environment is meant to trick us. Actually, it's just a matter of the button or the slide or at most a line of code. So what takes effort is making virtual space um, as is as it is created through these game engines seem like like they match their setting match your actual perception but that's just random there is a whole big range of of easily accessible settings that will just tweak with this um so for me the only actually really important question in all of this is who are we in virtual space okay so we're almost done and i want to leave you with two two parting thoughts, two observations. So I believe strongly that we'll start to live life across realities. Of course, to some extent, we are already doing that. Um, we've had phones and TVs and, and this kind of technologies in our homes for a long time. But now with VR and with people spending, um, actually living life um, in, in these virtual platforms, um, we're going to see an acceleration um, in this direction. So what do I think will happen? Um, where I think first things like game transfer phenomena are going to become way, way more common. If you're not familiar with this, it's basically when you've been doing something in a game for so long that then you um, unconsciously attempt to do the same thing when you are in the physical world. Um, it doesn't, it's called game transfer phenomena, but it doesn't have to be something you do in a game. Um, before VR I used to work a lot in a 3D modeling program for architects and just a lot, a lot, a lot. And sometimes basically like 10 hours a day. And of course, when you make a mistake or you put you put a cube or a wall in the wrong position, then you just do control Z on the keyboard, right? With your left hand. Um, and every now and then maybe like two, three times a year, I um, I usually make a, a paper model, uh, like a physical model out of cardboard for some room or a spatial idea that I have. And um, I cut pieces of cardboard and I stick them together and trying to design this thing in like the analog way. And when I glue something in the wrong position, my left hand goes into like the, like twitches into the control Z position. Um, so at some pretty deep level, my brain already has issues understanding that time in physical, like the physical reality does not block time, right? Like you can't go back to a previous state the way you do in the world of the, of this 3D modeling software. Um, and the second thing that will become a big deal, um, is basically the question around who controls these realities, their form, the transition between from one to another, and the degree of agency um, that people get when they're in there. Um, because a very, very big deal is, uh, this is a very big deal and a lot is at stake. Um, and last, um, I believe we're about to witness a rapid transformation of subjectivity as scale. What is subjectivity? Um, subjectivity is how it feels to be you, how it feels to be human. So this was this always changes 
um, how it feels to be us modern people today is not how it probably felt to be a person a thousand years ago. Also, how it feels to be me is likely not the same thing that how it feels to be you. Um, but what I believe this technology will bring about is a change in subjectivity at a pace that is noticeable. And I'm not sure we've lived to anything um, similar in the past ever. Thank you so much. That was it. All right. Thank you, Andrea. Let's uh, let's do a, um, an applause. You guys. <laughs> While people are all thinking, I'll ask. Um, so I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, uh, you know the the tool that you're building in your startup and how how uh, you imagine it will work in VR and what kind of the challenges and the um, uh, and the things that you're aiming to develop that is different from what exists right now. Yeah, definitely. So we um, we started a few years ago uh, making these um, these uh, pieces of, of scripts and plugins to Unity, which is what we use for internal purposes only, because we um, we kind of got uh, we were very unhappy with the typical workflow where you design anything basically in a in a three D design software and then you take it into VR just to look at it. Um, and we really wanted to just change things and really move a wall in VR and react to it in, in the immersive way. Um, and that felt like such a fundamental thing that that was missing. Um, a few years ago, Unity had what they called the XR editor or something that allowed you to see the gizmo in play mode. And then they kind of took that out. Um, but we we really want we really had the need to start to add this functionality ourselves because even that unity gizmo um even if if, if it hadn't been so buggy um it wasn't really what we needed for specific architectural needs you know like cut a hole in a mesh if you want to put a window and then move that hole so you have to regenerate the mesh every frame um and so we kind of started it like that um and then we started to test this on little clients that we have for physical buildings. So most of our work is focused on XR development. Um, but as I said in the beginning, we still design small buildings. We don't go for big projects because we want to stay with XR as our main focus. But we do design little houses sometimes. And it's mostly to try, it's mostly to be able to experiment a little bit with, with these clients and see how they would respond to these very new workflows. Um, because what I have to say is that um, what we're also very interested in is not just bringing this to architects. We found that um, the fact that you are basically in VR designing at a much lower level of abstraction, that all of a sudden the entire process becomes very accessible to people without a strong background in architecture. Because most of the things we do in architecture school is we learn, we learn abstraction, right? We learn symbolism. We learn how you take a 3D thing and draw it into D. So, so we go down from 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 this this three D object down the abstraction. So without that, and also there's the learning curve of of knowing the buttons of this software that allows you to move things to the point where even in the simplest architectural design piece of software, you'd still need a non professional like two three weeks so to put them in a workshop to be able to move a wall around. But in VR, basically. They can just grab something and then move it. Um, so it's a very simple interface. And um, it's been quite transformational, honestly. Um, so to think of it, one, one, way, one way to think of, of it um, and its transformation, transformational nature and the potential is, again, what I said in the talk, which is you end up designing different things and doing things you never would have thought of otherwise. But it's also bringing um, bringing clients into designing their things. Um, most architects um, kind of leave the room in horror when they hear me talk about these things. Um, and they say things like, well, but quote unquote, normal people don't know what a good building is. That's why we went to school forever for 
um, that's where our expertise lies. So um, I don't want to let my client decide where to put the window because I'm the one that's you know trained to know where to put the window. Um, and I only partly agree with that, um, especially when it comes to the design of um, someone's own house or apartment. Um, I think there's a dimension that's not really talked about, which is the fact that we learn in school what is the right way to do a layout. So we learn in school what's the right relationship between the bathroom, the toilet, the kitchen, and the bedroom. Um, so we have people live in these standard layouts that are predetermined. But I'm actually very interested to say, look, you're paying for your house. You want to live in it for a long amount of time. Why don't you optimize it so that it suits your life? So why should I tell you what the relationship should be between the kitchen and the hallway and, and, and the bedroom? Here's a tool that allows you to determine these spatial relationships in a way that serves your lifestyle because you have the deepest understanding of what your lifestyle is. Um, so we've had quite a lot of fun trying to do that. I can relate to what you just said about architects. We're remodeling our house, so. <laughs> Uh, feel free to ask uh, questions. I have a question. Um, so you mentioned how like humans are able to sort of adapt to different bodies. And um, like currently what I'm seeing with like most VR and AR headsets is um, like being able to like more capture the human body and put it into VR. So, so do you think like what's your thoughts on like the future of uh, VR input and locomotion? Is it more along this path or is it more along trying to find new ways that work better for VR, which may not necessarily be a one-to-one -one relationship? I think in the future, we're going to see just a much bigger variety of offerings. So right now, of course, most of the social VR platforms um, and these platforms that are for, I don't know, virtual offices and virtual education and so on, um, they do have humanoid avatars and they have no other choice. I mean, some of them force you to even choose between two genders. Um, I think that will change in the years to come. Um, I don't think the, I don't think everyone is gonna go into VR like jumping around like a frog or like a octopus, um, but more and more people will. So we will just see more and more variety. Thanks, that's interesting. I had a question about architecture in in virtual spaces. So, if you have if you have the opportunity to explore non non Euclidean kind of like architecture, where where like insides are larger than outsides, and you you enter one place and it spits you out in a different place than you would physically expect, like, how how do how do you how do you how do you model spaces like that? And how how do you build like like blueprints of spaces that you don't really have like like a intuition? Yeah, that's interesting. So first, I have to say, um, there is non-Euclidean architecture that's being built. So basically, what non-Euclidean means it is can't be described on a two-dimensional plane. So a sphere is non-Euclidean. You can't flatten it out. You can't describe that geometry oh, into in 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 two axes. So basically any cupola of an old church, that's a piece of non-Euclidean geometry. Um, in the world of computer science and gaming, this phrase non-Euclidean geometry in terms of environment seems to mean this kind of like convoluted tricks basically that you can do with shaders and stuff like that. So um, to answer that, um, it's super fun. And um, we have a little side project on the team um, we're, try we're designing like a little game to kind of, I know we work on it on Fridays, um, where we where, where we play with creating these environments. Um, there isn't really any kind of applications of that. Like I, I haven't had any, any clients or companies come to me yet and say, look, we really want this crazy stuff. If anything, it's been the opposite. Like sometimes I do try to design um, some of these like trippy kind of environment and and put them in commercial projects and sometimes i'm lucky and they take it and sometimes they're like no no this is too much like our 
the people that we're gonna are gonna use this application are not gonna be crazy about this is too much for them um so yeah it's it's interesting to see how the interest will develop i would love to see more interest and i would love to see um if we ever release this game um super curious to see how many people will play it and what their reaction would be um so yeah if, if people are into this kind of stuff and they enjoy experiencing these environments um um then i'm looking forward to designing more okay. awesome i'm <laughs> looking forward to seeing it <laughs> Kiri just sent in the chat uh, a cool non Euclidean space example. Yes, I know this video. Um, but again, I think it's a, the, the title is, uh, is slightly misleading in terms of what non Euclidean means. Um, but yeah, it's it's awesome. Any um, any other questions from the um, audience? Uh, I think I have one. Uh, you mentioned re you really enjoyed the uh, the architecture at the end of uh, Half-Life Alex. Was there any other games or applications where the architecture really stuck out to you? Not that I can think of. I've seen some really beautiful worlds. Um, some VR chat rooms are, are really stunning, but, but I haven't seen yet anything that really takes things into this direction where the, the logic of the design starts to become more atypical and interesting intellectually, you know, um, it, we're, we're still at a phase where most virtual environments are, are are beautiful because they have amazing modeling and amazing textures and out of this world light, uh, but not necessarily a design concept that's unique to VR um, that you can kind of engage with intellectually. So I'm looking forward to more of that. That's interesting. Yeah, thank you. Andrea, do you think for architecture that devices need to uh, look differently or have other types of sensors, VR devices for the in the future? Well, if you if you if, do you have like a wish list of like I wish the controllers will be different or I would have X or a whole suit or I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I I do have a wish list like and it's not even with crazy stuff. For example, um, just good pass through cameras. You know, like I want to go into I want to go into a real space and um, have pass through cameras and basically go with my controller and take um, the corners of the room. Um, and then I can just use the corners of the room to then regenerate, like generate that space then in VR. So then I can just um, furnish it or change it or whatever. Um, so yeah, just simple stuff like that. Um, like, like the, the hardware is there kind of to allow us to put virtual spaces into VR really fast. I mean, of course you can get a 3D scanner or 3D scan the room um, and then get that, but that's just like a lot of steps. Like I want it like right now, like I wanna put something on my head right now and then click the key points in this room and the key locations in 3D space of the window and then done like two minutes. So better 3D modeling of existing spaces. That's like. Yeah, like because uh, I think there are ways of doing that that doesn't require special devices or photogrammetry or scanners or anything like that. Basically, it's just a way to accurately input the 3D points of the corners and windows. Where's the door? That's it. All right, that was a fantastic uh, talk. Thank you, Andrea. Thanks again. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me.